Bluebeard's Daughter by Louis Couperus. Her name was Fatma, and she lived at one of her country seats near Baghdad. She was the daughter of Bluebeard by his first marriage, and she was a woman of marvelous beauty. About her moon-white face undulated her blue hair, falling down like a cloak over her frail shoulders. It is not generally known that Bluebeard had a daughter. Most people believe that he was killed, childless, by the brothers of his last wife, who inherited all his wealth. If they had, as I have, gone through the secret archives of the story, they would have found without much difficulty that Bluebeard died, his skull cleft in two in the arms of his daughter, and left her all his possessions. The young orphan, the charming Fatma, had loved her father very much, just as he had been very fond of her. Although she'd never been able to approve of the manner in which he rid himself of his many disobedient wives, she thought this method was not gentle, not noble, and psychologically monotonous. She understood perfectly that each new stepmother could not but yield to the temptation of her curiosity. She did not condone her father's course, and looked upon it as an inexcusable act of sadism. The azure locked Fatma remained a lonely orphan amidst her countless wealth, and all her servants and slaves who surrounded her like a royal court. The distinguished families at Baghdad, at the court of the caliph, spoke often of the rich, young, blue-haired girl, but, in spite of her unbounded treasures, no one wished to become the bride of son or nephew. Her locks were too reminiscent of horrors, so the beautiful Fatma remained alone, in her onyx terraces which descended amidst groves of date trees and gardens of roses to crystal lakes, and she wandered back alone between the onyx columns of the arcades to her summer palace, which paved with gold and silver flagstones was also roofed with gold and silver tiles. Until she could no longer bear her loneliness and was kindled with maidenly love for the overseer of her gardeners, he was a very handsome boy, who came from the country, and the rusticity of his occupation lent him, in Fatma's eyes, somewhat tired with over-refinement, an irresistible charm, so that she married him without worrying about what people would say of her at the court of the caliph, or in the distinguished circles of Baghdad. Fatma seemed very happy. She appeared with her husband in full state, in elegant splendor in the town and in the country, in tapestried gondolas, on the lakes and cushioned litters in the streets, with a retinue of slaves in the bazaars and even in the court festivities to which her rank and riches gave her admission, she and her beloved Emin made a magically beautiful couple. He, strong and young, glorying in his new riches. The upstart type did not exist in those days. She, radiating with love and inestimable jewels which sparkled on her gauze turban and the hem of her cloak, while wonderfully large pearls glowed from her azure locks, and the distinguished Baghdad families began to feel sorry that they had not taken pains to win Bluebeard's daughter for a son or a nephew. Suddenly, however, the report spread that Emin had died. Only the day before, all the inhabitants of Baghdad had seen him in the mosque, and look, now they heard that, he had died. A shiver went through the town, but the Grand Vizier and the Lord Chief Justice saw no reason for taking steps in the matter, as a very creditable rumor had given out that Emin had, on the hot day, eaten too much watermelon and expired after a violent colic. But people at Baghdad stared when, after three months, they heard the young azure-haired widow was again about to marry, this time to the lieutenant of her own bodyguard. Among so many servants and attendants, Fatma seemed to have too large a choice to take notice of the sons and nephews of distinguished families in Baghdad. The marriage took place with fantastic splendor, and Fatma's new husband gloried as Emin had done, now that he saw himself raised so suddenly from a humble position to that of husband, to his transcendentally rich and beautiful mistress. The young lieutenant, Fatma had made him general of her bodyguard, died suddenly, as it was given out of a fall from his horse. It was a vague report, and besides, no one had seen the young lieutenant general of Fatma's bodyguard either on his horse or falling from it. Nay, no one had seen him on the day of his death, and a violent emission spread through the Baghdad families and at the court of the caliph, because it was remembered but too well that Fatma was a blue-haired 
as her father had once been blue-bearded. The sorrowing widow Fatma, in her black mourning veils, starred with black diamonds, looked like the queen of the night, particularly as her blue hair shimmered through the mourning veils with such a suggestive nocturnal tint that she could, without any makeup, have appeared in Mozart's magic flute. However, she did not sing the heavy and difficult culturata, but preferred to take a third husband, this time simply one of the bearers of her palanquin. That young Ali was a magnificent fellow, who now, as third husband, looked at his damask samar like a young sultan. Could not be doubted, but what was doubted by the distinguished Baghdad families of the court of the caliph was whether, after three months of married life, he had died a natural death. What? Such a strong, fine fellow as Fatma's palanquin-bearing husband to die of malaria, so it was said, and be unobtrusively buried like that. Heads nodded to each other, eyes stared with horror, mouths twitched with secret suppositions, and the Grand Vizier consulted with the Lord Chief Justice whether they should not intervene in the Fatma case. The case in which one husband after another died and disappeared after three months of matrimony. They consulted so long, however, that Fatima married a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth time. The fourth time was a Persian merchant from Tehran, to whom a long life had been foretold from the lines of his hand. The fifth time one of her gondoliers, a sixth time a humble slave who worked in Fatima's emerald mine. Each time, after three months, the wretched husband died, and the sorrowing widow went through Baghdad like the queen of the night. Then the cup seemed full. Grand Vizier and Court Chief Justice repaired to Fatma's pleasure house, but it appeared that she had removed to another residence. For she had several, the one with the onyx terraces, the, and the one with the mother-of-pearl ballroom, and that with the crystallite towers, not to mention the one with the agate bathroom, that with the quicksilver fountain, and that with the secret libraries full of occult knowledge. So that the Grand Vizier and Lord Chief Justice, having trudged from one pleasure house to another, with no better fortune at last found Fatma at home in her pleasure house of science. She received them, slightly annoyed. She was not like the Queen of the Night. The beautiful azure-haired widow of six husbands seemed rather like Perry from Paradise in her transparent white veils. But in this case, a slightly annoyed Perry. "'What do you want?' she asked haughtily. "'To know the cause of your sixth husband's death.' "'Do start your inquiries,' said Fatma, "'with my sixth husband. "'We shall ascend to your first, threatened the dignitaries. "'Why not descend to my last?' said Fatma. "'And I have only this to say to you, "'that I have not much to say. "'My sixth husband died of Tertian Ague. The dignitaries were about to make an angry reply, but at this moment appeared suddenly the man of the Emerald Mines himself, the sixth husband of Fatma. He looked healthy, strong, and amiable, and carried a few folios under his arm. "'What's this?' exclaimed the noble gentleman. Fatma shrugged her fair shoulders. "'This means no more,' she deigned to explain, "'than that the dear boy is not dead. He is only rather stupid, and so to improve his conversational powers— I took him to this secret library, where he might read a little at his ease. But the Grand Vizier suddenly had his eyes opened. What about your other five husbands, then? Oh, blue-bearded, I mean, blue-haired, fat men. Yeah. They live, she admitted. Like my minor husband, but I sequestered my gondolier husband to the pleasure house of the quicksilver fountains to teach him to be somewhat quicker in his occupation of gondoliering. For he was often very slow at rowing the matrimonial boat over the lake of love, and quicksilver administered in small doses send the blood flowing through the veins. My Persian merchant still drags out his life, which will be a long one, in my villa with the agate bathroom, for he sometimes smelts unpleasantly of his caramels. My palanquin spouse I locked up in my crystallite tower because the wretch flirted with my women, and I wanted to keep him to myself. Then there is my lieutenant general. With him, gentlemen, I dance every night in my mother-of-pearl ballroom. He waltzes gloriously, and it is not proper that such an intimate joy should be indulged in the presence of all and everyone. So the darling quietly waits in the mother-of-pearl ballroom until I unlock it. 
And then, to speak the truth, my first boy is dearest to me, you know, my gardener, and honestly he is still alive and dwells not far away from the onyx terraces so that I can easily reach for him whenever I long for him. You look astonished, gentlemen, but there it is. You see, I am Bluebeard's daughter, and I take after him in soul and locks. He felt a desire for many wives. I feel a desire for many husbands. But he killed his wives on the pretext that they were disobedient to him. I never killed my husbands. I preferred to lock them up, to civilize them, and have power over them. If I am hysterical, I am also very much of a feminist, and in every respect I am a woman. What more do you want to know? And the proud Fatma stood haughtily before the two dignitaries of the caliph. But these unexpectedly called for their menials and commanded, Seize this bad woman and bring her before the divan of the Most High. Thus it happened. Fatma Bluebeard's daughter was dragged through the streets and all the squares of Baghdad to the caliph Stephen, who condemned her to lay her azure-locked head on the block. It is strange, thought Fatma, when she had given up to the hands of the executioners. My father murdered his wives and was very much murdered for it. I myself objected to this course. I, his daughter, never murdered my husband's. I attended them lovingly, nurtured them, civilized them, developed their faculties. It's true that in a somewhat secluded manner, in the onyx gardens, crystallite towers, mother-of-pearl ballrooms, and all the rest of it. And this conception of marriage, however, well thought out, also meets with disapproval. It's strange, continued her thoughts, but I believe, I almost know it for certain, that it is not possible to satisfy public opinion in the matter of love and marriage. When one has a blue beard or blue locks. And somewhat saddened by this irrefutable philosophy, she bent down her azure-headed head on the block, tried to solve the problem in the last second, but failed for a purple stream. Her last ideas flowed from her riven neck, and the azure head of Bluebeard's daughter lay in blood on the floor of the Hall of Justice, after which the six husbands inherited her wealth.